The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Job boards and uh, whatnot. Um, I think it started maybe, I don't know, three or four years ago or something like that, 2009. All right, so um, has anyone heard of OpenShift before? All right, all right. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, what is OpenShift. We're going to talk about why open source matters, um, specifically in the cloud computing environment. And I'll talk a little bit. I'll go off on a tangent, hopefully not too long, about cloud computing and uh, what it really means. Because everyone says cloud, 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 move to the cloud, blah, blah, blah. And it really doesn't mean anything, right? And so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then I will uh, show you guys the open source code um, behind this um, project that I'm showing you today, and we'll get it up and running on my uh, local laptop here, and I'll do what some people call a micro cloud or a local cloud, um, and, and we'll go through that. Um, so first of all, if you haven't signed up for OpenShift, it is openshift.com, or you can go to openshift.redhat.com. It is completely free to use. We don't charge for it. And it's basically a way for you to quickly deploy your apps out in a scalable fashion in the cloud. Now, when I say scalable fashion, the free tier, I guess you could call it, that we give away, you're allowed to create up to three applications with a gig and a half of RAM and three gigs of disk space. So if you deploy one app out there, you can only scale up to three nodes today. Um, we're working on introducing uh, a tier for companies who need to scale up to 100, 200 nodes, things like that. And that's probably where we'll make our money. We're not sure yet. Um, we, we do not have any pricing structure today. Um, what we're committed to is keeping this open source, having it be community driven, and always giving away for free what, what we do today as far as hosting. And it costs us an average of about $100 a user. Um, to provide all the back-end infrastructure as a service for these applications. You may not understand a lot of what I just said, but we'll go into that and explain, explain what all of this is. Um, but this is what the website looks like. Um, and if you want to create an account, you just click Try It Now. We just ask for an email address and a password. Uh, we don't ask for your dog's name, your cat's name, what kind of car you drive. It's just your email address and password. <coughs> All right, so what is OpenShift? Um, so OpenShift is Red Hat's free platform as a service. Has anyone heard of a platform as a service before? A few people. Um, some of the more popular ones out there is uh, Microsoft Azure, I think is what they call it. Um, Heroku, Google App Engine, Cloud Foundry, Engine Yard. There, there's a lot of people in this space right now. At Red Hat, we decided um, but we didn't decide. We, we came to the realization that a platform as a service will really change the way, as developers, we code and deploy um, our applications in the future. And so when we created OpenShift, we had a couple design tenets um, that we kept in mind and that we um, have stayed true to. And the first one is no proprietary APIs. And that's very important as you're hosting your code out in the cloud, you want to be able to have the freedom to take your code that you've written and move it to a different vendor um, very easily. Um, and what we're seeing now, um, which is bad for us as an industry, is that a lot of these cloud hosting providers will have a proprietary data store that you have to write to their APIs. Um, and, and it gets really complicated. In fact, one of my friends, um, he has a startup and they deployed on Google App Engine using their proprietary data store, and they're getting bought out by another company, and the other company doesn't want to use Google because they recently increased their prices, and they honestly went from being profitable to losing money overnight just on the price increases, and they were stuck. And so we wanted to um, not have any vendor lock-in at all with, with this service. 
So platform as a service, you're probably thinking this is kind of like Amazon, right? It's not. Um, who here actually has something deployed in the cloud today? Is anyone doing it not on Amazon? What are you using? I mean, I, anything, storage, compute, hosting, yeah. Um, so that's something personally that I'm a little worried about is it seems like Amazon, they have a great product. They really rev revolutionized how we can quickly spin up machines, but they almost have a monopoly <laughs> on the infrastructure as a service. And that's why as an open source community, we really need to get behind OpenStack and things like that. Um, and other infrastructure as a service projects so that we can compete with them. It's not good for any one company to control almost half the internet, right? When they had no elastic block storage outage, I guess about nine months ago, it seemed like half the internet was down. Um, Netflix streams all of their movies via Amazon. And, uh, you know, it's just something I'm a little bit concerned about. I, I think what Amazon has done technology-wise is phenomenal. I'm not saying... Um, that they are doing anything bad. We just need competition, um, and competition's always good. All right, so when people talk about cloud, uh, it's mostly marketing guys or your CIO or your manager, we gotta move to the cloud, right? It's gonna solve all of our problems. So when people talk about cloud, they're really talking about one of three things, and they probably don't know which of these three things they're talking about. Um, but here's the basic, the three components of what the cloud really is. We have an infrastructure as a service, which is Amazon EC2, basically, Rackspace has one. But it allows you to quickly spin up machines, which has changed a lot of people's lives and operations inside of IT groups because they don't have to procure hardware and wait for it. They can get it instantaneous, um, basically. And, you know, when I first spun up my uh, first EC2 instance, I'm a, a developer by uh, trade and I got my virtual machine, and then I had to choose what operating system I wanted to put on it, and then I had to configure SE Linux. Don't just turn that off, it is important. Um, I had to install Apache. I had to, I'm a JBoss uh, or a Java developer, so I had to download and install JBoss, configure it, know the insides and out of the application server. I had to install Mongo database or MySQL or Postgres or whatever I'm using. I didn't know how to tune the database. I had to uh, install and configure my firewall rules, set up any proxy load balancing, and it's something I hated doing. I, it didn't really, the only problem this solves is it gave us the compute resources very quickly, um, but we still have to manage all of those ourselves. And it's not something I wanted to do as a, a developer. So software as a service, I'll skip right up to the top here. Um, everyone probably uses software as a service today. Um, Google Mail. Seems like three quarters of the companies in the world are using salesforce.com right now. And then um, this middle part, which OpenShift is, is called a platform as a service. And it sits between an infrastructure as a service and software as a service. So here, um, when you get a machine, you still have to bring all of those things that I just talked about, the management, um, your code, your application. Platform as a service sits on top of this and manages all of that for you. So in a platform as a service world, the only thing you have to bring to the table is your code and your users, okay? And software as a service, the only thing you have to bring to the table is your users. You don't manage the code. You have no visibility into the code most of the times. And, you know, this kind of, let's see if I can exit out of this. Um, let's try X. If I can do this, I'm looking sideways. Is anyone familiar with this? I know it looks terrible, but this is called the Gartner hype cycle. And basically, every technology goes through this hype cycle. Okay, virtualization went through this um, years ago, ten years ago. Virtualization was going to solve everyone's problems. We have all these um, compute resources sitting around underutilized. We need to virtualize everything. And so the hype cycle basically says it gets to a point to where it promises to do everything and everyone's talking about it, but no one's really using it. And so virtualization got a lot of hype back in the day, and today you really don't hear about it anymore, but everyone's actually using it. 
uh, most data centers are using virtualization in some, some fashion. And so you get to the hype, and this is a terrible uh, graph here, but, um, and then it comes down to where hype starts uh, petering out a little bit, but then you have a real adoption cycle where people start using it. And so virtualization is, is up here now. I mean, it's just everywhere. So this is my personal opinion. I will go through where I think uh, the cloud stuff is right now. Software as a service is right here. There's a lot of hype about it. You guys remember this years ago, everything you read, software as a service, software as a service, it's gonna do everything. Infrastructure as a service, um, I, I'm gonna say it's right here, and you guys can disagree with me, but I still think there's a lot of hype about it, but it's not as much as it used to be. It's kind of went down a little bit. People are absolutely using it, but it hasn't reached mass adoption yet. Platform as a service, what I'm talking about today, it's probably right here. It's a lot of hype right now. How useful is it? We'll see. Um, when is it really going to change our lives as developers? Um, it can today, but we're probably a year off or so before this reaches massive adoption. Um, maybe that's a little optimistic on my part, just because I know how easy it's made my life, and so I wish it would be a year from now, but it might be more like a year and a half to two years out before we really start seeing this in, in all of our day-to-day -day work environments. Okay. So that's basically the, the three areas of cloud, right? And if you guys have questions or want to disagree with something I said, feel free just to interrupt me. I'm a very informal presenter, so if you disagree with me, I, that's good discussions to have. I don't get upset about that. So why platform as a service? It allows you to start quickly and iterate quickly. Um, typically, the, the platform as a service provider manages the cloud and the app stack for you, okay? So that's what I'm gonna show first of all, and then I'm gonna show you the open source side so you can do this in your own data center and, and still have the software manage it for you. So it lets you focus on, on your code and customers and not on deployments. I used to manage, uh, and someone mentioned RHN earlier. Has anyone used RHN? Um, yeah, I used to manage that team at Red Hat and I used to work on, on, on that software as well. And uh, it was a, it was a very interesting thing when we would push new versions out. It got very complicated, and a platform as a service will help that as well because, you know, we would RPM up everything. Um, our RHN was actually a mix of Perl, Python, and Java code. And so it, it got quite messy there towards the end, um, especially deployments, versioning, it, um, making sure you're not taking downtime and whatnot in case there's a security vulnerability. And so this will help alleviate those problems as well. So how do you use it? Um, you create an account, like I said, it's just an email address and password, or you can uh, download the code. You can install the client tools. That's how I prefer to um, interface with it on the command line. We also have REST-based interfaces and a uh, web console as well if you want to do everything in the web. You choose a namespace, you create an application, you choose your language, you add cartridges, and then you push your code with Git. Everything with OpenShift is Git. Um, get back. All right, so I live this world right here. Um, if there's other people in the room that's lived this, uh, you can tell me if you agree with this. Um, but like I said, I managed um, RHN, I also managed uh, www.redhat.com and all the developers and infrastructure behind that. And uh, you know, when we had an idea for a new application at Red Hat, first thing we do is have to get budget for it. And that budget would have to be very detailed down to number of man hours, you know, and how much hardware in all of the environments, because we have a development environment, then we have a QA stage and production environment. We had to uh, submit the hardware request, so we basically would get quotes um, from our vendor, um, review those quotes, negotiate the prices, uh, and then uh, finally um, put a PO in to, to get the hardware. So we'd eventually get the hardware and then we'd have to go through that full stack. We'd have to you know, unbox them, rack and stack them, 
Uh, we, ran, we run Puppet for everything, and so hope that helped alleviate some of our concerns with the deployments. Um, and then we would code, we would push, and we would do this in each environment. And if our application was more popular than we thought, um, we'd have to repeat this whole process again and order more servers because we're not, we don't buy them and just leave them sitting in boxes waiting to be used. We buy them as we uh, need them. So now with a platform as a service, and I'll show you guys this. I know it sounds a little markety, but it's actually true. You can have an idea. You can code and test it and launch it without having to worry about the infrastructure. And this is very important, especially if you're doing a startup or maybe a mobile application that has a back end, because you don't know how popular your mobile application or your application in general is going to be. So why would you invest in all of this hardware um, until you know. So if you deploy to a platform on, as a service, you can deploy for free, and then as your application hopefully grows to millions of users, your systems will automatically scale to handle that load, and you never have to think about it or worry about your systems anymore. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Maybe you can see the screen better. So again, uh, you can create an account, openshift.com. You can use that promo code if you want. Um, what does that promo code get you? Absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> uh, I put this on here, and this is why we have promo codes. It really gets you absolutely nothing. But it allows us to track like where people are coming from so we know like where if we should go to more open source conferences or more Java type conferences. It's just for us. If you want to use it, great. If not, I won't be angry. Uh, the important thing is you sign up, though. All right. So um, first thing you do, yeah. So here you are you're just saying you know, go to the website, but you can also download the software to try to deploy our own instance. That's right. And I'll show you that a, a little bit later. It's kind of like the big reveal, because this didn't used to be open source. Didn't used to be. It uh, was not open source before, and we just uh, open sourced it, I think, last month last month or so. And so what I'm going to show you first is the hosted um, environment, and then I'll show you the uh, live CD that you can download. I'll also show you where to get the source code, things like that. If you want to build it yourself, I would suggest just using the pre-built binaries. Um, do you guys mostly use Linux? Um, OK. Well, you never know, right? Um, so we do have pre-built binaries for Red Hat, obviously, and Fedora. Um, what we need help with is to um, get binaries for Ubuntu and, and Slackware and things like that. Um, so if someone in the community wants to help us out with that, that'd be great. All right, the first thing you do is you install the client tools. Our client tools are actually all written in Ruby. So you just do a gem install RHC if you have Ruby and gem installed. You create a namespace. I'm going to skip through all this, and I'll just show you how it actually works. Um, so what do we actually support on OpenShift? Um, we support Perl, Python, Ruby, Java, Node.js, PHP, if I didn't say that. Um, someone actually got COBOL running on it. Um, yeah, well, and it really made us angry, and I'll tell you why. We had this April Fool's joke plan for a long time uh, that we were going to announce that we were the cloud for COBOL, right, to get people's COBOL code up in the cloud. And like two days before April 1st, this guy emailed us from his company and said, hey, I got COBOL running on OpenShift. Check it out. And we're like, oh, man, <laughs> ruined our joke. But uh, uh, basically, anything that's open source or will run on top of Linux will run on OpenShift. The second design tenant, the first one I talked about was proprietary. We wanted to make this the best platform as a service for open source languages and technologies and databases. And so if it's open source, we'll run it. Obviously, we're not going to run Oracle um, databases or anything like that for you. Um, but yeah, any language, pretty much any framework, any of the big open source database, whether it's a NoSQL database or a, you know, a traditional MySQL or Postgres, uh, all frameworks will essentially work as well. And what's interesting is that we actually use Amazon EC2 on the back end for all of our infrastructure even though I was saying it's probably not a good thing that they own all the market. There's just no other game in town for us to realistically use. They, they drive the price so far down. It's a, it's a commodity now. 
no, you just can't compete in that market with how cheap things get with those guys. And everything is RHEL 6 on the back end. Um, and it's a fully managed RHEL 6 for you. So if you deploy your applications out, we do update it with the security errata updates. Um, it's actually a real entitlement to Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You can't actually log in and, and look at it, but, but it is a, a real entitlement on those systems. All right, enough of the slide where, let's see if I can change this. Yeah, so our, we do support um, JBoss uh, AS71 right now, and it's the full EE stack. Um, actually, that's not true. It's the one. I'm trying to do that again. That was pretty awesome. It was a, it's the web profile, so you can't do like uh, a lot of EJBs right now. We're working on that, and hopefully we'll have it done in a couple of weeks. We're hope, hoping to have it done by JudCon at the end of this month. Mm-hmm. No, it, it all comes. Yeah, you don't have to add anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. The question is, um, does JBoss come standard, or is it something you have to add on yourself? Um, and it comes standard. Um, all of these languages do. It's very easy to get up and running with them. Uh, and, and it makes life a lot easier, especially if you're wanting to learn something like Node.js or wanting to learn MongoDB, instead of having to figure out how to download and install MongoDB, which isn't hard, so it's probably a bad example. But to get the drivers installed and all of that, um, that all comes, comes for you. All right, I'm going to open up a terminal here and we'll get cooking. Can you see that okay? Increase the font. What? Black on white. It is. I just checked. I don't know what happened. Yeah. You guys want black on white? Is that what you want? What? Okay. <laughs> All right, so I have the RHC command line tools already installed. So the first thing I can do is the RHC domain show. And uh, let's see if I'm on the internet. I don't even know if I am. We'll quickly find out. Yep, I am. So what I did is I ran RHC domain show. And this basically made a REST call up to our REST services. Um, and you can download these client tools as well to see how we're actually doing it. But my namespace is just on paths. You could use your name or whatever you wanted. It's just an arbitrary name. And then uh, it lists all of my applications that I have deployed. Okay? So let's create a new application. What do you guys want to do? Java, PHP, PHP? All right. PHP? All right. So let's do RHC app create. We'll call it uh, SE Linux. I uh, can't do that. We'll just call it that. And then we'll do PHP 5.3. So what I am doing here is I'm saying RHC, create an app, name my app SEL, and it's going to be a PHP 5.3 app. So I'll hit enter, and it's making a REST call. Hopefully my network doesn't flake out like it's been doing all day. Um, it's making a REST call up to OpenShift. We're provisioning a node for you in EC2. Um, we're configuring the system. We actually use SE Linux, um, Linux control groups. Is anyone familiar with that? We, we use those two things heavily in order to provide a secure and performant environment without doing virtualization. Um, not to like sound boastful about Red Hat, but no one knows SE Linux uh, better than we do, and so we were able to uh, use SE Linux for this. Um, yeah? No, it's multi-tenant. The, the question is, does every node have, or does every app have its own EC2 node? The answer is no, it is multi-tenant. And that's why SE Linux and Linux uh, control groups are so important to us, because that's how we 
uh, guarantee that your application can get the processing power and the memory that it needs outside of a, a, a virtual environment. And this normally takes like 15 seconds, so I blame Sprint because I'm using this little Wi-Fi thing here. It's also, um, like I said, installing Apache, making sure Mod PHP is installed. It's uh, setting up a private Git repository for me. And this is the first time I've created an app, so it wants me to add that to my keys. Yeah, question? Are you starting an instance right now on Amazon, or are you using a mix? The question is, am I starting an instance now, or, you, or um, creating a new instance? Is that what you said? Or using an existing instance? So if there was a whiteboard, I would draw out how this actually works um, under the covers, but we basically have hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of EC2 machines, and we use M Collective. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. That basically gathers stats. It gets pretty complicated under the covers. We find the best machine for your application to go on. If, if there's not one, we will spin up a new one and add it to that for you. And so to answer your question, it really depends on the load on those servers. And also, what's cool, um, is we can move your application in real time if the load on that box gets too high over to a different node for you um, without you having to do anything so we can guarantee performance issues um, as well. So this is done, okay? So it also propagated my DNS, DNS out uh, worldwide. So if I go to this, maybe I don't have Firefox set up to click. Cell.onpaz.rhcloud.com. This is a templated uh, app that's out there just to get me started. Um, but what's important is all the infrastructure and underlying technologies uh, was already created for me. And just to, like I said, it takes about 20 seconds. It took a little longer here for some reason. So let's make a quick change, and I'll show you how easy this is. So I'll go into my directory and since this is a PHP directory, um, or a PHP application, I have a PHP directory. That's where my source code actually lives. If it was Java, are there any Java developers here? So for Java, we actually use the Maven build system if you push your code, and we'll see your POM XML file and we'll build it on our servers. If you don't want to do that, you can just drop your war file or your ear file in the deployments directory. So I'm going to go into the PHP directory. I'm going to vi test.php. I'm going to do uh, PHP, echo, hello world. So I just created a new PHP file. I'm going to add that. And then I'm going to commit it. And then I'm going to push it. And so when I do a git push, I actually have a, a remote repository set up. And it's sending all of my code up to my OpenShift servers for me. And so that's done. We also have hooks. If you wanted to automate something every time you did a push, maybe you want to update your internet page, say, hey, a new version's out there, or whatever, you can do that. So now if I go back to this URL, test.php, you can see that my uh, code was pushed out there for me. So, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and that's something that really sets us apart, especially it, we give it away for free. So here's my blog, which I just reinstalled last night, so it's going to have absolutely nothing on it. But it's gshipleyonpaz.rhcloud.com, and then it's also www.grantshipley.com. And the way we do that is we have what's called an alias. I'll show you this real quick. So where's G Shipley? Yeah, Beer Shift, that's a mobile app. I'm actually giving a talk on it in the morning. Um, it's a social beer drinking application that runs on OpenShift and the iPhone and Android. Um, I can show you guys that if you want. We can completely change the talk. <laughs> um, so uh, G Shipley here has an alias of www.grantshipley.com. So I just went in and I added an alias. You have to make sure, obviously, that you have uh, permissions to add CNAME records in your uh, domain registry, and then it'll work for you. OK, so let me show you guys something really cool. I'm going to do RHC app create. Let's call it WordPress PHP 
And I'm going to open up my browser, go to github.com slash openshift. Search for WordPress. Maybe. <sighs> My internet just died. Terrible. All right. Well, I'll switch over to my Mac now anyway, because I wanted to show you guys the um, this running on my Mac um, desktop. Yeah? Uh, what about the spell script? <sighs> That's tough for us to do. We, we do do it. And I don't know, admittedly, I'm not as familiar with SSL as I should be, just because I'm not an admin type guy. But I think piggyback SSL, I think, is what we support. But I'm not 100% sure on that. And I don't know the details enough. SSL certs. Now, that's on the free tier. Um, if you're deploying your company website out there, obviously, we would support that, sure. Uh, but on the free tier, I think we do. But you have to. it's a little crazy or a little different than standard way of doing it. So, I don't know. Email openshift at redhat.com and, uh, <laughs> and I'll find out for you. Any other questions while I'm getting this Mac trash? I carry this for the iPhone app I was telling you guys about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so for Perl, we support, the question is how do you add uh, dependencies for your languages, whether that's APIs or in the Java world, jar files or CPAN modules or pair or PECL modules or NPMs and Node.js. We basically support the standard way of doing it for every language other than um, PHP. We actually have a deplist.txt, which you can put your, just list your pair modules in, and we'll pull them in for you. Um, but there is a way to do it for every language. Okay, so, so if I were to develop a Perl app online, just, just use CPAN on the back end, or would it use the distributions package? Yeah, if you were pulling down other libraries to use in your code, we would pull them down via CPAN. Is that, is that what you were asking? Yes, I'm asking if it's CPAN or if it's the distribution Perl or a Oh, the actual Perl language itself that we're using? Mm -hmm. um, do I need to package up the libraries from CPAN? Or you do oh, no, you CPAN? don't have to do that. You just list them and we'll pull them in. You can specify the versions. Oh. And, and However, it works with, uh, maybe. Here we go. Starting, maybe. Is it searching or starting? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hang on, let me close my email. There might be something important here. <laughs> I don't want to show And my RC. Hang on. I got to really get out. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. Let me kill all this. Let me get on the Wi Fi. All right, what was your question? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, it, most of the cases we have a directory. Uh, in most cases, it's called libs. I'm not sure about the Perl one, um, what it's called, but you can drop them in there and we'll resolve it that way. Yeah? Uh, for Ruby apps, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when, you, when you're bundling different dependencies on your. Uh, in your. G uh, yep. Um, so it'll, it'll pull those things, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I saw in Heroku that was really well is if you have mm -hmm. custom. Yeah. It, it does build on, on their server side. Do you guys do that? Yeah, we build on uh, our servers. Um, and, and that gives us some advantages. It's normally a lot quicker for us because we mirror most of the uh, repos, especially for Java, like iBiblio, to pull in Maven dependencies and things like that. So we do get some advantages from that. All right. Uh, let's uh, see what we got here. Let's make sure. Can you see that? All right.
All right, so I'm doing the same thing here. Um, I'm just creating a new app. I'm calling it WordPress, and it's a PHP 5.3 app. Let's see if my internet's actually working. And I'll show you WordPress real quick, because it also um, will show you how to use a database with an OpenShift application. So what I did is this command um, real quick, and then I'm going to add MySQL. Let me cut and paste that to save some time, maybe. Application, oh, I already have one, so let's name that. WordPress 2. Um, can you ask it a different way? I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, for example, here in Google, I'm going to try to add uh, MySQL. Mm -hmm. And that's because on that image, you already, on that instance, you already have MySQL? Yeah, so the question is, uh, when we add things, is it already on that system? Um, for the most part, yes. Um, because it is running RHEL. If they're RHEL packages, they are available and already on the system. What's interesting um, about our databases, though, and I'll show you this, is our databases are not actually shared. So when we create a database for you, it is your database. It, it's not, a, and you have root for the database. You can do whatever you want. So let's add the database real quick. I just created this app. So I'm going to say RHC app, and we call databases and things like that cartridges. Um, so think of like the Nintendo system, you would plug a cartridge in and it changes the state of the machine. Um, so the same, same situation here. I'm going to add a, a MySQL 5.1 cartridge to my WordPress 2 application. Could I add a what? The question is, could you add an Oracle database? Absolutely not. <laughs> and you shouldn't. <laughs> well, that's true, actually. I keep forgetting that. Uh, well, what are you going to do? Um, with the open source version of this, you, you could absolutely do it yourself. We have a cartridging API to where you can write your own cartridges. And if it was in your own data center, you could write an Oracle um, cartridge. And yeah. All right, so here's my MySQL database. I have a root user password and it created a default uh, database for me just based on my application name. It also gave me the connection URL. You'll notice this is a non-router or private IP address. You can't actually connect to it from any um, node other than your application's node. So I can't connect to MySQL locally. It's kind of a pain in the ass. Can you connect to it from another application? No. Well, not yet. We will allow that. The question is, can you connect to a database from multiple applications? Um, today you cannot. That will be coming out soon, very soon. Um, so that was kind of a pain. So if you want to do that, we actually have a RHC port forward command that you can run, and you pass in your application name, and it'll actually scan uh, your host and forward all the ports so you can connect to your MySQL locally. Yep. So uh, this is on a separate EC2 instance, this database? Uh, the question is, is the database on a separate EC2 instance? Um, more than likely not, but it could be. It could be. What do we do for backups? We do not back up your data um, because there's too many legal ramifications for that. Your data is your data. We do not want anything to do with your data or to house it in case you get sued and then we get subpoenaed and we're just staying out of that business. So what we have actually is a command um, called RHC snapshot. You can pass in your app name and it'll basically <clears throat> It does this over SSH, but it actually goes to your OpenShift server, gathers up all your source code, all your configuration files. It does a database dump. If you're using like MySQL, do a MySQL dump. We also give you the, the files for the database, um, the actual files on the file system, so you can recreate it. And you can take that targz file and do whatever you want with it. You can deploy it locally. You can recreate an app off a snapshot. Yeah. Uh, with MySQL, are you, on the EC2, are you using the block storage or are you using 
Question is, what are we using for storage? We're using ABS on the back end, elastic block storage, yeah. Okay, so I created a WordPress application. I created a database. Now, like I said earlier, because we have no proprietary APIs at all, your source code should just work out of the box. So I'm going to show you that by grabbing the WordPress source code. This? That? Yeah. All right. So what I'm doing, if you're not familiar with Git, is I'm saying, uh, what did I, what happened here? Did I paste wrong? Fatal remote upstream. Oh, hang on. Okay, so I'm adding my remote, uh, or the remote WordPress GitHub repository, and then I'm going to issue this git pull, um, which basically is going to override everything I have in my directory. You remember that stupid little sample web page that we displayed? It's gonna remove that and replace it with the WordPress source code. So I'll do that. It's downloading it from GitHub. So that's done, so now if I go into PHP, it's the WordPress source code. So now all I have to do is git push. And it's going to send my source code up to OpenShift. And because it's PHP, it's, it's not a compiled language, so it's, it's not going to go through a build process. Yeah? That's right. So, so the question is, how do you handle things that you wouldn't want checked into revision control, like passwords? Um, you would actually set them as environment variables. That's the practice we suggest. Um, and I can show you some that, that we set for you by uh, default. All right, so let's see if this actually worked. Word. Press two on paz.rhcloud.com. Did I spell it wrong? Word res. WordPress. And here's my WordPress site. So it was just the. It does it for you, actually. Um, like I was saying, environment variables. Um, so. so Yes, it did. So I'll show you another cool thing about OpenShift is here's my Git URL. This is also my user ID for the box and the host name. And so I can SSH in. And if I do EMV and, you know, grep uh, DB, it's probably a little too much information for you to parse, but it does have like a DB password. And so in the config files, instead of having the password in PHP, and you can do this in all languages, I basically use the system environment variable on the connection the stream. Kind of uh, say it again. It's the same sort of, and there is a difference here, and I'll show you, because there was a little bit of magic there, because uh, the database was, has to be created, right? And so what I did is, um, let me exit out of this. This is the only uh, change to the core WordPress here. If I go into dot OpenShift, there is a action hooks directory. And here you can do uh, scripts that will happen. And so if I look at my build script, I think. No, where is it? Let me look at the files I went through. This deploy, because PHP doesn't build. Um, I just run this little script to see if a database has been configured and been installed. If it hasn't, I, uh, I create one based on this database export that I did. So that's the only magic that, that really happens there. The source code's fine. Um, and I just did that to, to make it easier for people because WordPress is one of those things that everyone's grandma loves to use, and so we want to make it really easy. Not that your grandma would ever come to the command line. She would come here, and uh, I'll show you. We have these things called instant apps. 
Let me log in here real quick. Yeah. The uh, question is, or, or the statement was, that you can SSH into that instance, but you don't have root. Um, that is correct. You, you know, if you're SSHing into your box, we wanted to allow people the freedom to do that. But at that point, you might as well just go with a straight infrastructure as a service if you're having to log into your box and start managing things yourself. Um, we do have a do-it-yourself cartridge. Um, like if you wanted to basically just use OpenShift as an infrastructure as a service instead of specifying like a language type, PHP or Java, you can just do DIY and you basically just SSH into the box and install whatever you want. Uh, you, have, you, you can compile things, you do whatever you need to do at that point. And I think my internet just died. So while that's going, I'll quickly swear I can do anything. So I'm going to uh, show you, let me go back. Uh, I don't have the slides on here anymore. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, like I said, it's probably been a month ago, we realized that people want to take advantage of this, but they can't necessarily do that um, for policy compliance reasons, um, especially if you're a government uh, shop or something like that. Or people may just have a huge investment in hardware that they already have um, in their data center, but they still want to be able to take advantage of how easy it was to, to get something deployed out there. Because think about it, you know, as developers, if we wanted to spin up a five node cluster in the past um, to kind of mirror our uh, production environment, it would take a lot of hassle for us to do that. We'd have to get the IT guys to, to uh, you know, basically do it for us. And we can alleviate that now. I could create a, you know, a 50 node exact replica of production with a scaled Mongo database in, you know, less than five minutes or something like that. So it will change how we develop because today we develop locally, single node most of the time, and we deploy to a cluster. And some of the junior developers, it's a real struggle for them, and it's a struggle for some of the senior level engineers as well. Um, but junior developers, they don't understand that in a clustered environment, you can't actually store session state on the file system, right? Because the next server won't be able to pick it up. So things like that. And so it will help us out as developers. So I'm going to uh, create a new virtual machine, it's Linux, it's a uh, Fedora 64-bit, and give us a name of SE Linux, click continue, we'll give it some memory here. Um, I'm not going to create a startup disk, just because this is a live CD that I'm using, um, so I don't need a hard drive for it. Great. I'm going to make sure that I have a little more video memory. Now I'm going to mount the ISO image, and it's a live CD. And again, you can download this. Um, if you log into openshift.com, there's a download link there. You can also go to github.com slash openshift if you actually want to pull down the source code, it's written in Ruby if you want to work on that. We have pre-built binaries, like I said earlier, for um, RHEL, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and uh, Fedora. If you use a different version or flavor of Linux, we would love help porting it over to that. Yeah. This is uh, an instantiation of That's correct. Yeah, um, the question is, uh, what exactly is this, right? And so this is a, the exact same code that we're using on the hosted stuff that I just showed you that will allow you to run it locally using uh, virtualization, and we actually use KVM um, for, the, for the OpenShift origin side. Okay, so the first thing, when you boot the live CD, it'll give you a little information about it. Um, and then if I actually go to my terminal, 
by default it creates an admin user with an admin password, so I can do RHC domain create. I'll give it a name of test. Oh, maybe that's the wrong. That's weird. I forgot the command on how to do this because you only do it <coughs> once. Five minutes? Five minutes. All right. I only done this once. You, you set up a namespace the first time and you don't mess with it after that. Um, but all the commands are here. It already has JBoss, uh, PHP, Perl, all of those things that I showed you on the hosted environment running here on this live CD. You can copy it over to your hard drive and start using it. Um, so a lot of people ask us, you know, KVM, well, what about OpenStack? So OpenStack, um, if you're not familiar with that, is basically an open source project to allow you to create your own infrastructure as a service similar to EC2 in your own data center. Um, we are very committed to OpenStack. Remember the OpenStack Foundation. Um, we have several uh, core contributors uh, on the team. And uh, our goal is to be the best uh, platform as a service to run on top of OpenStack in your own data centers with the open source project. So how can you get involved? It is an Apache license. Um, it's very business friendly. We do not require a contributor agreement. So if you want to submit code, you don't have to you know, sign the paper that a lot of open source projects, larger open source projects want you to do. It is truly an open source project. Uh, we're not, uh, we didn't open source it for the sake of open sourcing it. A lot of people say that they have an open source project, but it's really a closed open source project. Try to get something contributed to one of these projects and the company controls everything. And that's not what we intend here. We really want it to be a community driven project. So how can you get involved? Um, get the code, go to the wiki. Um, if you're not a developer or if you're not a system administrator, there's a lot of other areas you can help, translation, uh, documentation, um, whatever you, know, you want to help out with. Um, we don't have a governance model yet. We'll kind of flesh that out as the community starts growing around this. This is only, OpenShift as a whole has only been around about eight months. And the open source um, origin bits have only been around for about a month. So we have a lot of, a lot of room to grow. We've made a lot of progress. And uh, we look forward to you guys helping us continue this project and, and making it a, a great thing for us to use in the industry. So that's basically it. I don't have the slides on this computer, so I'll save you the marketing slides at the end. But um, I'll be sticking around for a little bit if you guys have questions. I think I'm out of time now. W one question, yeah. Uh, can you send me help scale this application? Oh, yeah. I didn't show you that. So basically, the question, how do you scale the application? When you create your app, you can do RHC app create, give it a name, my app, and add dash s to it. This will tell OpenShift that you want this application to scale automatically. If you don't want it to scale automatically and you want a manual scale, you can do that as well. What basically happens here, when you pass in dash s, we create two nodes for your app. One is a HA proxy, and then we create your app under that. And so then as you, and the way we actually scale is we take a look at your application every 20 seconds to see if you've had more than 10 concurrent HTTP requests. If you have, we add another node and load balance it with HA proxy. And then as you know, we, we relook at that and you're beginning to satisfy demand, uh, we'll either remove a node or add another one and we'll bleed those connections off. Yeah, and if you want to manually scale, you can. Um, you would just embed HA proxy and then there's a scale up and a scale down command if you know you have a release um, that's going to get some traffic to your website. Yep. Can you run this on Podstack? Um, not yet. We would love for it to run there. But it, realistically, it'll run on Eucalyptus and it'll run on uh, Amazon um, EC2 today. We have an AMI for it. Yep. So We're not using Delta Cloud, no. That, that's what we're working on right now. And we actually have another project at Red Hat called Aeolus. It's an open source project that will kind of allow you, it abstracts the whole cloud problem. There needs to be standards with how we talk to cloud providers, but it's gonna abstract that so you can talk to, to all these cloud providers with a single API. And so hopefully that's what we'll eventually run on. 
Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast; uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack, as a project, is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.